thank you everyone for uh, joining, first of all, Raw Crystal 2020, very exciting. Um, and also specifically uh, my talk. Now, uh, as per uh, my field, um, we're going to talk about security and more specifically about um, how to secure our Crystal apps. As Crystal um, gains more and more traction, we will be using it more and more, I guess, in production and in environments where our data is actually um, important to us and not just some um, small and uh, specific tests or um, very niche use cases. And while we grow as a community, as a language and as uh, solutions and products, we will need to put security um, forward. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So um, a bit about me uh, or why maybe you should take my word. <laughs> um, so I'm a father of two. Uh, I'm the CTO of co and co-founder of uh, New Religion, a crystal in production company. Um, I'm a lover of open source, uh, a hardcore Linux user. Yes, I use Arch. Um, a cybersecurity researcher for more than 15 years. Um, I've been a, I call it proper developer for six years. Um, I've been in IT and networking for more than eight years and uh, playing around being DevOps for more than three years. Now, when we talk about security, um, and about our crystal applications, we're talking about this very specific field called application security. Now, application security is a, um, a whole big world. Um, but when we talk about application security, I guess some of you would say, hey, wait, no, uh, what about the ports? What about the network? What about all kinds of other segments that are also important to secure? But um, security is about priorities and we need to make sure that we are covering our most uh, accessible assets. Now, right now, uh, we have some very interesting information. Uh, Verizon's 2018 uh, data breach investigation report flagged web applications as being more than 70% is the cause, sorry, of more than 70% of the data breaches of that year. This means that from all of those hacks that we hear or do not hear about uh, in uh, the media and uh, other resources, all of those, or at least most of those are around um, broken, vulnerable, or just uh, susceptible for attacks, uh, web applications. Um, there are a few reasons for that. Uh, one, of course, is that web applications are very common. How common? Um, when we talk about where web applications or web-based technology, to be honest, because APIs, um, API gateways, REST APIs, and all kinds of miniature interfaces, even your router runs a web application. Uh, your smart, smart house uh, where you can control with your mobile app. This mobile app in the end uh, sends some kind of REST calls to some remote server. It's still web-based, right? Um, we have smart cars that usually do almost exactly the same. And of course, um, as some of us know, uh, the former sushi chain and uh, other um, uh, blockchain-based uh, uh, technologies, those are usually using um, web-based technologies, not at the core, but at least um, in the uh, higher, uh, higher, more accessible for users uh, interfaces. Now, uh, one quick word regarding application security. Um, if you don't know about it, there is a very nice organization uh, called OWASP. It's the Open Web Application Security Project. If you have time, if you have interest, uh, you can just uh, Google their name and they have a lot of information about application security with code examples, with a lot of information. Most of it is around Java, but um, you know, at least something. 
So now that we understand that uh, most of our problems are coming from applications, right? And application security is most likely what we should be taking care of um, as soon as possible. Let's um, talk about where in the applications we might care, right? Or where we are more vulnerable. So there are a lot of places, uh, but if we try to rethink really on where are the uh, more pressing ones will be, um, those will be around user input, which is the most susceptible for attacks. Um, that's uh, around uh, values, um, basically getting values from the user, getting information from the user. Um, that could be uh, getting a username, getting information. Um, anytime we get input uh, from a user, there are problems. <laughs> Um, there is the parsing aspect, um, all right? The user sent us uh, a non-malicious data, but uh, this data is uh, hard to process, like very large JSON files or very complex or uh, a lot like multi-layered zip files. And those can create a lot of issues in our applications. Um, the third thing about user input is about validation. Um, Validating data or data validation is a very complex subject. Um, there are a lot of layers to think about. It's not just about, um, all right, uh, does this e data has those and those patterns, which call a deny list. Um, this, uh, this way of handling validation is very flawed because we would need to think about all of the ways that the data might be malformed and try to get rid of those. Um, we should instead think in uh, allow list, basically try and see what data we care about and only allow this kind of data. Uh, then we have authentication and authorization, which is about roles, access rights, right? Users, admins, um, group managers, um, guests. This is a very tricky part of most applications. And there are a lot of situations where this is uh, a very interesting place for attackers. Uh, then there is the login. No surprises there, right? Uh, if I can get uh, login credentials or a login session or information about login, then of course uh, I can hack into the application. Then there is uh, data handling. Now this is a world in itself, of course, but we're going. But um, maybe a bit of uh, a few words about that. Usually, when we talk in security about data handling, we talk about data in two ways. Um, data in rest and uh, data in transit. Uh, data at rest means, um, for example, a database, a file system file. Um, and how do we secure those things? So of course we have um, encryption. Uh, for example, when we take or save uh, information from the user in a database, how do we keep it safe there? Uh, we can, of course, use some kind of hashing, but that, of course, means that it's useful for um, validation that the data is okay, but it's not actually encryption. Uh, it's good for passwords, so we won't have to keep passwords in clear text, but it's not good for data that we need to retrieve later. Um, file system. Uh, when we want to save files and make sure that um, only specific users can access them. This is, again, a very tricky part about security. You always have this um, who has rights also in the file system. Can the root user access it? Can the uh, standard users access it? Is it read? Is it write? Is it execute? There are a lot of layers there as well. And of course, data in transit. Now, here things are usually a bit easier because data in transit is um, protocol based. So as long as the protocol itself has some kind of uh, security layers so that we can defend from many in the middle situations like TLS and other kind of encryption, we should be okay. Should be. Um, now, Let's go into crystal code and let's talk a bit about um, some examples 
uh, around those kind of issues. So just a word, um, this code and all of the other codes in, the, in my examples might not be one-to-one -one working scenarios. Um, it was more about showing an idea. So if there is something that does not compile in the same way or that does not behave exactly the same thing, feel free to reach out to me and I'll either fix it or give you code that actually works. So the first example is what we all know, like I think every developer out there uh, heard the word um, SQL injection somewhere or sometime. And this is an issue where um, a user by abusing um, lack of validation or sanitation uh, and proper handling of user input uh, managed to um, inject or execute uh, unauthorized uh, queries inside our database. So given our example here, uh, we have an HTTP server uh, that gets user information, um, get requests from the user, uh, does something about uh, like opens a database connection, and then does something. In our example, this something is uh, taking the ID query parameter um, and uh, trying to look in the database what is the in this case, name for the user that has this ID. Now we expect something like uh, one, two, three, or maybe a UUID, or maybe some kind of another, da another data structure, right? But because we didn't build any uh, logic here uh, that protects us from something like that, um, we might be expecting one, two, three. But what happens uh, if the user send us uh, something like the example below, uh, some kind of an escape from the query that we intended to send, and instead send something like drop table users? Now, that won't be fun, right? And this is a very destructive action. Um, but what if we have credit card information and instead uh, the user will inject um, select uh, everything from the credit card number table, right, or curl. So um, this kind of attack can be used for both um, harming us or taking data out, which is more usually the case. Um, let's talk about a simple fix. The simple fix is using our beloved query parameters. This is also the best practice um, if you look at the crystal docs. Um, they're telling us to use uh, this kind of syntax where we tell the database that whatever goes in that section is a query parameter. It's not something that should be handled like a uh, um, some kind of a database command. Um, in some ways it will stringify or escape or just know how to handle it without um, risk in that case. Now, the thing about this uh, example is that it still wastes resources, right? We still need, we will still send this information um, to the database. And let me tell you a bit, like a little secret. There are ways to bypass this uh, kind of scenario. There are ways to still inject something malicious or to um, make the query be malicious, even if we used query parameters. It depends on specific situations and our knowledge of the uh, architecture, but it still can be abused. Now, this example, uh, again, I guess would be called um, a deny list, but we want to do something better. We want to go to the allow list. We want to make sure that when we do something, it's because we understood that this is actually the data that we wanted to get. So one example, and again, this might not be the perfect code. The code can be, of course, improved, and we can do a lot of smarter things like not um, create the database connection and um, do a lot of things to make sure that we're not wasting resources here. But uh, just to show the uh, idea of allow list is that we will do some kind of a test to make sure that ID in our example is uh, 
parsable as an integer can be uh, cast into an integer. Now, if it can't be an integer, we'll just say uh, respond with uh, ID has to be an integer and let the user figure out what to do. Um, if it's an integer, we will try and create our uh, DB query and uh, get back the response if we have one. Now, um, we still make sure, even in this case, to use the query parameter. Why? Because we're paranoid. Because even when everything might be uh, castable into an integer, maybe the user created some kind of, I don't know, bytes, uh, injected some kind of uh, Unicode, something that managed to uh, pass as crystals to I um, uh, function and still return, yeah, this could be an integer, um, but it will harm the database in some way. Um, so that's why we still want to use the uh, query parameters because we prefer to never trust anything, only ourselves. Um, now, one more thing, uh, should we even let the user know uh, what was the problem from one, way, from one side? it's um, a better user experience, right? Um, we want to give the user information about the failure and how to fix it on his side, um, but we're also giving out information. Now, where this can come, by, come back and bite us is in situations where you have login and you're telling the user uh, password does not match the user or um, you, there is no such user instead of just always returning, uh, username and password are incorrect. Even if the username is correct, but the password is incorrect, don't give information that might help um, attackers, right? So maybe this exact use case isn't exactly it, but we better use this kind of mindset uh, from the beginning. Now we go into another problem. This one is uh, very interesting. Um, some of you might uh, know the name um, XSS or cross-site scripting. In this case, there is no database. Um, what we want to do is to have a dynamic, awesome and cool um, website that um, whenever uh, our users are coming into, they'll have some kind of a form and they put in their names and then when they do submit we will say hello and welcome to my site mr whatever or mrs whatever and um you know it looks awesome we know who they are they're happy to see their name in our website and it's pretty cool but we expect uh for them to actually give us uh johnny or Jane or some kind of another name. Uh, but what if instead they uh, decide to name themselves um, script source, um, evil script, and uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So this will be less fun. Now you might say, wait, but if they do that, right? If they change the query parameter, um, instead of saying Johnny, to say all of this script stuff, um, they're just harming themselves, right? Like, I don't care if they um, see the JavaScript that they injected um, into the page that only they see. Well, this kind of attack um, usually is used to attack your other users. Um, as an attacker, I would take this uh, link that has the uh, expected name parameter. I will put there some kind of uh, uh, JavaScript that instead of, I don't know, painting uh, the, um, the web page that returns in, I don't know, colorful and amazing colors, it will instead say uh, some, or maybe it will inject some kind of a, uh, um, uh, a keylogger, or it will fetch the document.cookies and will send them to a remote website. 
Um, in some other cases, uh, especially when uh, zero days for a browser are, are found, it might be even used to run remote code execution on your users' machines. And this is 100% uh, defend the users. Well, before we have, before the SQL injection is more about defending our own application, here we were defending our own users because this is a client side attack. Um, now, all right, um, should be pretty easy to fix, right? Um, Crystal do have this uh, handy HTML escape option. So we can just uh, HTML escape uh, whatever is being given to us. Uh, we'll make sure that it will not um, execute in the user's uh, browser. And I don't know, I think that's everything should be fine, right? Well, um, not really. <laughs> if you look um, at the line above, uh, this is called a polyglut payload. It does some very nasty tricks. Some of what it does is escape all kind of HTML escapings, it does all kind of um, special bytes, uh, HTTP, HTML, uh, URL encoding, and it has a lot of information in it um, that might, uh, in the end, effectively escape our HTML escaping. Now, uh, <laughs> um, how much is this um, possible or how common is that? Well, if we write into Google, um, XSS bypass HTML escape, we will get back 1,100,000 uh, results. Um, as you can see, there are some obvious uh, newer results, so it's not old data, it's not old information. There are links here from um, 2020. Um, this is a hot topic. It's relevant. And um, from one side, uh, you know, you say, okay, uh, so they might do it. But from the other side, having your um, users hacked, for whatever reason, and your application actually being the uh, the cause of that, because of some kind of a flow, that won't shed good light um, on your product, on your company, and on what you uh, want to achieve. So it's not just about, okay, it's the user's problem, because so if you're a bank, for example, or you're creating some kind of a, a blockchain uh, application or whatever, and one of your users get hacked uh, using an XSS, um, their cookies are being um, taken and um, or other session information, and another malicious user is logged in instead of them taking all of their I don't know, precious uh, uh, digital currency or even maybe actual money if you're doing some kind of credit card transactions. And they won't come to the users telling them, oh, yes, um, haha, it's an issue in the client side. No, they will come to you and say, listen, your application is vulnerable because of a vulnerability in your application. Uh, Oh, okay, uh, four minutes. Uh, so because of an issue in your application, uh, your users currently got hacked. So how common is XSS? Look at this amazing table. So this is a table from HackerOne, um, one of the um, uh, bug bounty platforms. A lot of hackers go there to get uh, uh, legal targets to attack legally and get money from that. So the most uh, uh, common and found uh, vulnerability 
the most both impactful and rewarded for was XSS. This is critical. This is a high severity vulnerability. And people just uh, from bug bounties got around $4 million just about XSS on one year. So please take care of it. Now, let's talk about what's the per paranoid fix, right? So um, the paranoid fix might, might be to um, do some kind of a regex matching, right? Let's make sure that it's A to Z and uh, <laughs> um, uh, there is some uh, A to Z. And uh, if yes, cool. If not, let's raise it. We don't want to get this information. Cool. But what if we need to get from them an email and show it? Less fun. You can see the regex for an email. And of course, it could be better or worse, but um, it's a bit tricky. Uh, but let's say we managed to do that. Uh, we verify that only things which are relevant in an email and we've been more very thorough and we're 100% that they can inject it. But then people want to leave comments on your website and you're like throwing the table and yes, free text comments. What do I do then? So because uh, of course we don't have increased the built in has XSS uh, function to use, we need to be uh, very vigilant. Now, um, a bit about what Crystal already offers um, out there. Uh, I know that we, you talked about Lucky before. We had, uh, uh, I think, uh, the last talk was about Lucky. So Lucky has Shield. Um, Shield, as you can read, I guess, is a comprehensive security for, uh, solution for Lucky. It has um, a lot of things regarding uh, authorization, authentication, uh, login, logout, session handling, um, and so on. What it doesn't have is filtration. And input filtration is something that usually um, we won't find because it's very hard to do. Um, another option is the HTTP protection, um, which, uh, as you might see, have something called an XSS header. Now, this might help a bit, but still, this is passive. This is more about um, making sure that the security of the headers is okay, but it's not really about parsing, inputting, and filtration of parameters. Now, what's our way forward here? Um, we heard that there are a lot of vulnerabilities, a lot of security issues. Um, how do we protect ourselves? So one thing, and this is the biggest rule about security, please. Attack filtration isn't simple and security isn't simple. Never cook your own when it comes to security. This is especially relevant for encryption, math, and all of those. Um, uh, so please don't cook your own. Uh, there are things out there and uh, we should either as a community create something that has enough uh, visibility that everyone can scrutinize because that's the most important part. Uh, <laughs> yes, please don't cook your own, exactly. Yeah. Um, now attack vectors are evolving. So stay updated and update your shards, right? Um, if some shard has a vulnerability and you're not tracking uh, either main or, um, okay. Um, so uh, just a few more, uh, so just update your shards. Uh, Crystal is still young and we're improving and the future holds better things for uh, security. We need to embrace a few uh, external libs or build our own, but uh, for example, lib, in, lib injection, uh, a C library that can filtrate uh, uh, SQL injections. Um, also on the front end, we can use mature uh, frameworks like um, React.js, Angular that had enough time to handle those client side issues. Um, now, if you're interested, this is something that we're doing uh, with the Crystal community first. Um, New Religion is an application security testing solution. Now we have a free for you guys 
um, offer that can help you be secure your applications. If you want, cool. If not, forget I said anything. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for hearing my talk and stay safe. Thank you, Bar. Um, thanks a lot for the for the talk. I'm sure uh, many millions will be will be saved by uh, by people implementing the solutions you've uh, suggested here. Um, while I get uh, Steve on the call to start uh, the next talk, do you want to take the question that is there very very quickly on the Q and A? Uh, uh, yes, sure. So. Um, yeah, uh, good question. So what kind of low level uh, buffer overflow now pointers that are attacks is LLVM vulnerable? Uh, can we expect LLVM to be an attack vector? So the thing I really like about security is uh, most of the things are really punishing us for playing with the low level uh, parts. Now, this is what I like. I know that some, uh, some de crystal devs do like to uh, access pointers and play with C libraries. And of course, this is where you might see those kind of things. But having thoroughly um, fuzzed the crystal library, uh, common, uh, common interfaces, APIs, things that you would use, usually use, I didn't found something that is like very critical. One thing I did find, and um, that's something that uh, uh, I think that the uh, uh, Manas team and especially Brian uh, are aware of, is that there are issues with um, libpcre, uh, basically regex, where there is uh, some ways to crush it and go into an invalid memory access, but uh, Hopefully this will be taken care of.